Okay, uh, in Jude, verse 3, we've looked at this passage uh, several times uh, recently, and I'm going to look at it again, and it's the principle of contending for the power of God. Contending or taking our stand to ask God for the breakthrough of apostolic power or for uh, what is sometimes called a breaker anointing, which is a, a, a term that we link back to Micah chapter 2, verse 13, 12 and 13, Micah 2, verse 13, uh, 12 and 13, where uh, the Lord speaks about an anointing to break open uh, for the uh, purpose of God to go forth in new dimensions. Well, let's read here in Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. So he's saying, I want you to contend. I want you to fight. I want you to press into God. And I want you to contend earnestly for the quality of experience that was once delivered or that was presented to you by the early apostles and by Jesus himself. And there's several different ways to contend for the apostolic faith. There's a doctrinal dimension where we want... We want to preach what the apostles were preaching. And through history, there's times where God raises up leaders that contend for uh, the purity of apostolic doctrine. So we get back to justification by faith and, and just the precepts of the Word of God. And there's another dimension. We want to contend for the power dimension. It's not enough just to have right ideas. We want to have, we want to have the experience in the Holy Spirit. And then there's a third dimension where we contend for apostolic lifestyles. We raise a standard for the, for the way that we live and the way we carry our hearts before God. All three of those are very important subjects. I'm, I'm touching the second one tonight. Uh, but it's necessary, it's necessary, Jude said, to contend earnestly. Meaning these three things will not automatically kind of show up one day in your life. You won't automatically have deep understanding of the apostles' teaching. You won't automatically just move in the power of God. And you won't automatically live in the apostolic lifestyles described in the book of Acts of the early apostles. You're going to have to earnestly contend. You're going to have to press. You're going to have to go after it. You're going to have to be intentional. You have to get a vision for it and to resist everything that pulls you to the right and the left and to have a holy dissatisfaction of anything less than the faith, whether it's the doctrine, the power, or the lifestyle, the faith which was originally presented by the apostles back in the book of Acts and the, and the, uh, uh, the gospels and the epistles, etc. And that's what we're going for. Business as usual, Christianity, we all know this, is not, is not good enough. The reason that we're here tonight in this place is because somewhere in our hearts we said we have to have more. And one of the major premises of this place at the very center of our DNA is the cry we must have more in a number of dimensions. The cry for fullness, the cry that we want to have everything that God has ordained to give the human heart in this time in this time of history. That is one of the, the real uh, war cries. That's one of the real banner cries of this house. And some folks uh, maybe have, uh, I don't think very many, but maybe some said, well, I just kind of came because the worship was sweet. I went to a conference. They had good worship. I went to be around worship. Now I heard they had good coffee as well and some really cool people. And I, that was really neat. I uprooted my life because I wanted to be where the music was good, the coffee was good, and the people were cool. Beloved, that's not really why we've gathered here, although I like cool people, good coffee, and sweet worship. I really do like all three of those things. But that's not why I'm pouring my life into this. I want to be with a company of people that have a vision to go, for, go with all of their energy and the grace of God for everything that God will give the human spirit. I don't want to come up one degree short of that which was available in this time of history. And that is really the war cry of this place. That, it is the, it's the family cry as well. It's what we are about as a people. And there's a number of different uh, uh, applic uh, manifestations of this. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, very common passage. It's one that uh, wouldn't hurt to read it every week. 
but uh, uh, we don't, but it wouldn't hurt us to. It's the passage where Jesus is speaking of John the Baptist and uses him as an example of how we are to live as New Testament believers, as New Covenant believers. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it says, uh, the kingdom of God, right in the middle of the passage, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, when it says the kingdom of heaven, that's the same as the kingdom of God. It suffers, it says here in the New King James, or you can put the word it permits, it rewards, it honors violence. The kingdom of heaven is so set up the way God runs that he honors and rewards spiritual violence, not physical violence, spiritual violence. And what is spiritual violence? Well, in a very simple uh, uh, definition, fasting, prayer, apostolic lifestyles, giving to the poor. In other words, it's that which is not natural to our fleshly ways. It's violent to our fleshly, unrenewed minds. To give your money to an invisible God to help people you don't know is violent. I mean, that goes against everything that most people are taught all the days of their life. To, uh, to uh, spend in tremendous amounts of time in a room talking to an invisible God, telling Him what He tells you to tell Him, is a, is a violent way to live. Meaning, everything in our being cries out, don't do that, go do stuff. And though we are to go do the things of the kingdom, but there's a violence where we are, we are resisting the current of the day. We are resisting... The uh, business as usual, we're resisting the status quo, not just of our culture, but even of our own fleshly, unrenewed ways in our own heart. Prayer is resisting that. Fasting, going without food, is resisting that. Saying no to, fle- to, uh, to fleshly lusts. Lust, there's many types of lust. Scream in our being. Sp- they, they cry out in our being, feed me. All these lusts, one expressions, we say, no, that's an act of violence, is what Jesus is saying. You're going not just against the culture and the status quo. You're going against your own unrenewed mind in fleshly ways. It's spiritual violence. There's, there's criticism that goes with it. There's sacrifices that goes with it according to our fleshly mindset. And that's what we're about. We're going after the, the, uh, the things that God does not give automatically. We're going after the things that God only gives when you determine together you can't live without them. And that's what spiritual violence is. And he went on to say this. He goes, let me tell you a little something here. The violent, these radical, praying, fasting, giving, serving, believing, persevering people, the violent, that's who they are, they take, they take the kingdom by force. Now, mostly... The Word of God describes our relationship to Him as receiving freely. The way into the kingdom is we receive salvation as a gift. We receive so much as a gift. And when we say yes in our brokenness, our weakness, we receive it. It's automatic and it's free. All we had to do was say we want it and line up with our hearts. And we really want it. The Lord says there's a, uh, I, I mean, the Word of God describes a tremendous amount of blessing that, it, that is automatically received if you really want it and you give yourself to God through Jesus Christ. So you give yourself to, 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 to Jesus, Father, the Son, whatever. But there's another dimension of the kingdom that is not automatically received freely. It's taken by force, by the resolute. There's a dimension of Holy Spirit activity that is not automatic. It is only given to the company of people who are violent, And it's more than they've decided that they want to go for broke. They rise up together and they take it by the force. It's force. And the force means that they're taking it is uh, all that's involved in the grace of God of denying the ways of just the normal ways of life to press into fasting and prayer, believing, persevering, bearing reproach, resisting uh, fleshly lusts. That is what the force and the violence is describing. Force and violence are describing the same thing. It's all that goes on inside of our hearts to go after this thing. You know, I, I love to tell the people as I come and go about 20, uh, 24-7, and I, particularly I love to tell them about the night watch. 
And they just go on tilt. They go, they do what? Every night. Five, six, and some of them seven nights a week. Most of them five and six nights a week. Uh, You've got to go after it. Meaning the vision for this is quickly stolen from your heart. It's violent. It is not the kind of thing you go to a seminar and all of a sudden you land in a life of violence. You got to go after it in a determined way. You have to hold on to it. You have to say no to a hundred emergencies and a hundred voices calling you at the right and the left. There's a hundred things to pull us off the path. That's why Jesus described it as violent. It is not automatic. It's not natural. It doesn't come easy. And the vast majority of believers are content to live without it. But beloved, I am not content to live without going after with a spirit of violence everything that God will give the human heart. And I want to do it in the company of an apostolic company of people. And what I mean by apostolic, I'm using, you can use that word several ways. I'm talking about a New Testament apostolic in the word, in the sense of a New Testament standard and model for our faith. We're going after this thing. And don't be surprised if you go hard three months and then all of a sudden a few more months come, go, come and go and you look back and you go, I kind of lost it there for a few months. I don't know what happened. I was running so intense. But the last month or two, I just kind of did a little this and did a little that and did a little bit of this over here. And if I'm honest with myself, I'm not doing what I did originally. And don't be surprised because it takes violence to start it and it takes violence to stay with it. And when that touches you, you go, oh, that's why I lose my grip on it so easily. I didn't know it was violent. I just kind of thought, since it was such an exciting idea when I heard it, and I did move and joined it, I just kind of thought it would automatically happen after I did all of those things. And I want you to know, it is a, the Lord wants you to know that only violent people, and I don't mean loud, And I don't mean extravagant in your personality. I don't mean an extrovert. I mean a violent resolve in your inner man, a violent resolve at the heart. You may have a very quiet personality. You may not ever be seen or known by many people. You may sit over there at the back and and you come, but you've got a violent resolution in your spirit. You're going after this thing. And so don't use the word violent to mean loud, although I like loud. Loud's fun. Loud's cool. I am loud. I want to be loud. My wife says you shouldn't be so loud. I go, it's fun being loud. You ought to try it. (laughs) Then if she does it too much, I go, shh, don't be so loud. (laughs) She goes, there you go. There you have it. Anyway, so I'm not against loud, but loud is not what I mean by violent. Violent is this this resolve in the inner man. And my prayer for you is that you enter into the spirit of violence. But first, you have to know it exists. You have to know this is, we're going after something that is not automatic. We're, we're going after a dimension of the kingdom that does not show up on its own. That's what IHOP is all about. We're going after a realm of intimacy, and we're going after a realm of revelation, and we're going after a realm of power. If I had to sum it up in just a sentence or two, I would say that we exist, this prayer furnace, we're going after a new realm of intimacy, We're going after a a new realm of revelation. You could put the word eschatology on that if you want, but it's not a limited eschatology. A new realm of revelation, and we're going after a new realm of power so we can feed the poor, heal the sick, walk in community, plant churches, and preach the gospel across the nations. We're looking for a new realm of intimacy, a new realm of revelation, and a new realm of power. That's what we're going for. That's why this house exists to contend for the apostolic faith once delivered, or you might use the word, presented to us by the early apostles and Jesus himself. Another verse that is exactly means the same thing as contending is right here, the verse we're reading. The spirit of violence. This inward resolve to take it. The Lord says, the introductory dimensions are automatic. They're free. All you do is show up and say, yes, you get forgiven. You feel a little bit of the Lord's presence. A few, you can lay the hands on the sick and a little bit happens every now and then. A little bit happens day one. You can preach Jesus. One of your friends gets saved. The first day after you've been saved, there's an anointing for evangelism, but it's an introductory anointing for healing. It's an introductory anointing for evangelism. You read the word and a couple of verses jump out at you. It's an introductory anointing for revelation. You feel a little bit of God's presence. It's an introductory anointing for intimacy and it was automatic. You've only been in the kingdom 24 hours. It's already happening. You're going, well, that was easy. And the Lord says, it's free. 
It's automatic and you received it. But don't limit your vision to that which is given freely and it's automatic. Get a vision for that unique realm that must be taken. It must be fought for. It takes a spirit of violence to begin it and a spirit of violence to maintain it. It won't come automatically. And that's what this place is all about. A new realm of intimacy, we're going for it. A new realm of revelation, we're going for it. Not just revelation of the Word, but just the spirit revelation of just in ministry as well as the Word of God. And we're going for a new realm of power so we can do the kingdom of God together as a family, as an army, and all the other dimensions that the Word of God describes. That's why we're here. But I want you to know, I want to, sh- I want to shake you up. Uh, I think people kind of like the idea that there's something we have to take, we have to go after. I think most people like that idea. But the thing that I want to shake you up on is the idea it takes violence and maybe you haven't come to grips with that reality that you must have a spirit of violence on you in the grace of God if you're going to actually participate instead of show up in the chairs and just watch the rest of us participate. We've got a growing number of people showing up in the chairs and watching a core go after it. We want to go after this thing. And, and the difference isn't that they don't like the vision. The difference is they don't understand it takes the grace of the spirit of violence. I mean, everything, your family, your friends, your conscience, your brain, your body, your money, your activities, the emergencies, pleasures, entertainment, legitimate and illegitimate, will scream at you to get off the path. Everything under creation will will cry out at you nearly to get off this path. The legitimate pleasures of life, the legitimate activities of life will scream at you to get off of this path. Because of, as I've said many times, of all the legitimate pleasures and the legitimate entertainment and recreation and activities of life, you can only do one or two of them and still have time to cultivate fire. You can't do a lot of them. And just because they're legitimate do, does not mean they're fruitful for your life in this season. Many, many legitimate things for a brother or a sister, but for you in this hour, they will mean you will lose the fire in your heart if you go after them. It's not that they are in themselves sinful. It's that it takes time to cultivate fire. It takes time to have a spirit of violence. And you can't do everything that's permitted if you're going to be a fiery, violent person in the grace of God. We're going to constantly fight to be fighters. We're going to, we're going to fight to have a spirit, of, a spirit of violence among us. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Lay aside the encumbrances that so easily entangle you. Lay aside the encumbrances. Those are the legitimate pleasures. And lay aside the sins that so easily beset us. In Hebrews 12, 2, there are encumbrances. Those are the good things of life. And there are besetting sins. Those are the bad things. The writer of Hebrews says you have to lay both of them out of the way. Too many legitimate good things will choke your spirit and you will never enter into the purpose of God. The encumbrances of the good things that are not in and of themselves sinful, they will keep you from running the race. Just too much chatting, even if you call it fellowship. Just too much bebopping around, even if you call it liberty of the spirit going where God leads you. Just too much just not going after God and redeeming your time and pressing into the heart of God. Those are encumbrances. And we've got to lay those things aside. And we have to lay aside the besetting sins as well. But there's two dimensions in Hebrews 12 too we lay aside if we're going to run this race. I don't mean, I don't mean uh, uh, just kind of uh, mosey down the path. We're going to run this race. We're going after it. A marathon pace, yes. We're not sprinters. You better get in a marathon pace. But we're going after this thing with an intentional focus. We're not waiting for revival just to show up in our life. And then we're going to have a new realm of intimacy and power and revelation. Suddenly, individually, we're digging our own well. And corporately, we're digging a well. Individually, we're developing a root system in God, our private history. And corporately, we're developing a root system. That's what this place is all about. Okay, number one, it begins with a vision, with a vision that there is more to be had. And don't, don't underestimate that. That is a great line of demarcation uh, in, uh, in amongst the people of God. A very small amount, it might be millions, but it's still compared to hundreds of, uh, of uh, millions of uh, believers. 
It's a small percentage. Millions of believers have a vision for, for, for more, but hundreds of millions don't. It's, it begins with a vision that there is more for you. I mean a lot more. And, and I have found over the years, I've been in ministry, I have found that there, there is a big line in the sand, a line of demarcation. One group that wants it to be a little bit better. So they go to the seminar down the road that says how to do your ministry a little bit better. And I appreciate those seminars. But they think, hey, we want it a little better. You know, if we could grow from 200 to 400 and go from eight small groups to 15 small groups and have a little less division and a teeny bit more money, hey, I'd be happy with that. And a lot of people want to get it a little bit better, whether it's their ministry or their marriage or whether it's their family. They want to get a little bit better. And they think, you know, that's kind of cool. And there's another group of people, a small percentage, again, it's millions, that say it can be a lot better, radically, drastically better than what we have right now. Most people want it a little bit better, but beloved, I I believe in the vision that there's a lot more that God is going to give in this hour of human history. So it begins with a vision to, to have more, the vision for fullness, the vision to have all that God will give the human heart in this age. It's a breaker anointing. We want to break open the purpose of God. I want to be a part of an apostolic company of people that changes history soberly, that changes history. Not because I want to be known before men in the earth as a history changer. I want to go before God and I want to be a part of a company of people that didn't, quote, change history for the sake of it, but we entered into our full inheritance, which happens to be changing history. I don't want to change history so I can say, da-da-da-da, I changed history. Oh, that's the guy that changed history. Boy, I wonder if I could meet him someday. It's not about people recognizing you did it. It's about standing before God in eternity, knowing you entered into your full inheritance that you were invited to. And it is to change history. I believe God has given an invitation to the whole body of Christ to be history makers. The whole body of Christ. And they gather in companies, and if they will press in, they will change history. I don't believe there is a, uh, I mean, there, there, there's measures on God's call on, on every group. But I believe every group, if they would go for all that God had, they could change history in their geographic area. If they could shake up their geographic area, undoubtedly it would spill out. In the modern communication systems and technology, undoubtedly it would spill out to other nations. Just accidentally it would. And yet uh, so a few people have a vision to do that. I have a sober vision. You have a sober vision. Others do as well. Many ministries do. Most ministries don't, but many. Again, there's millions in the earth who have this vision, and we're part of a large company. And yet, uh, again, my heart cries out because the vast majority of the hundreds of millions who don't, and the reason I'm saying that isn't so you can feel special. I'm one that's pressing in. That's not why I'm telling you. It's so that you know that in your coming and going in the body of Christ, this is an odd idea, a strange idea, and they will not encourage you or help you. They will resist you. And that's why I'm telling you, born-again believers who love God, many of them do not have, do not ascribe to a vision for fullness. And I'm only telling that to you to gird you so that you'd be ready for resistance when you go out and say, guess what we're going to do? We're fasting and praying and believing for greater works than these, and we've got fasting teams and this and that, and we're going to believe for healing and prophecy teams. Isn't that cool? And they look at you and they said, you're a cult. You're a full-on cult. That's what you are. You go like, well, it's just in the Bible. How could you say that? Well, boy, no one told me to get ready for that. I th- are you a born-again believer? Yes, I love God. Are you telling me I don't love God? No, no, I just am just surprised that you think I'm a cult. I thought that this is what Christians did. And in my early days, I just kind of thought everybody would be excited about pressing the limit. And, oh, man, I ran into all, I just said, I mean, the good guys were mad. I thought, now, nah, my pride and, and goofy things helped them get mad. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm just talking about even the ideas. I mean, I, I, gave, I gave the enemy and my friends such a big target that it was really easy. <laughs> we're going to burn bridges. We're going to, we, I don't want an escape hatch. I want to dare to believe for the fullness. Beloved, there's a pain in believing when you have to wait. There, there's a pain. I've been believing for some years now, and I've seen many, many people uh, pressing into God. And five years turns to 10, and 10 turns to 20. And they have not just have they've given up, they are in pain of disillusionment because of the waiting. Because they dared to believe, but with conditions of time. They said, we're going for broke. And they added whisper, as long as it happens in five years. 
And here it is 15 years later. They're angry at God. They're disillusioned at the church. And they don't even, and even the mention of revival, it, it kind of makes them bristle a little bit. And they go, Ugh, I did that. And I said, well, you did it for three years. You did it for five years, but you haven't done it for an entire lifetime. And I'm talking about daring to believe with no conditions of time, believing and waiting for God's timing and pressing all the way through. It's, it's, it's the way God calls us to do. We've got to burn the bridges. There are no escape hatches. I have committed myself in the life of, I mean, in the grace of God before the Lord. I'm not going to live again. I'm not going to live outside of a company of people who fast and pray in an earnest way till the Lord returns. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be amidst of a fasting, praying people doing it in their midst until I meet the Lord. And I'm, I'm no escape hatches. And if revival is prolonged or the things I'm believing for and I die without seeing it, I'm going down with the ship. I am not bailing out. I've burned all the bridges. All the escape hatches are gone. I'm doing it to the end. But when you determine that, and I don't mean you do it here. You do it wherever God puts you. When you determine that, there's a resolution. There's a settledness in your spirit. There's no escape hatches. There's, there's no time uh, conditions. And that's, Lord, if you do it within 10 years. And I, I cannot tell you the pain I have had over friends, dear friends. They were pressing hard with me in 78 and 79 and 82 and 88 and 92 and 98. And many of them, the very mention of revival, because they gave three or four or five years to it, it makes them angry and it makes them painful. Uh, that causes pain because they had a time frame and they had an agenda and they had a condition. And now they have God on probation related to this subject. And I, and I told them even back then, guys, we're doing this till the end. They go, yes, yes. But somewhere in their spirits, they, they had an escape hatch. And I want to challenge you to dare to believe all the way, no way out. No way out. 